Let's begin at Luke 16 and 10. Luke 16 and 10, where Jesus taught, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much, and he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. So what we have is we have the basic principle of how we proceed in our Christianity, our spiritual life, and most of our secular life. Because the people at the top, those that you look all the way at there, they go, wow, they're awesome. They didn't start at the top. Now, I know a lot of times they didn't come to your attention until they were already at the top. So you have the misconception that they started as number one and stayed at number one. It's the old joke, anybody can be an overnight success. It just takes 20 years to get there. And to get to the top takes a lot of work, whether we're talking about secular success or we're talking about spiritual success. Being number one, you start somewhere way down the ladder. Now, we may be different places way down the ladder, but we all start down. And then those who understand how to be faithful in every little thing and learn the value of every little step, those are the ones that will consistently, year after year after year, make progress and more and more progress. And they're eventually the ones that spiritually we tend to look at and say, man, I'd like to know everything he or she forgot because they have reached that level. But the way they reached that level was one tiny step at a time. So we're training. We're training all the time. I, my saying is everything is training, and it all is training one way or the other. And so we're going to train through the daily mundane repetitive steps when it doesn't even look like it matters. We're in that place where you know nobody's watching. I mean, you've been in the house all by yourself all day. Ain't no way anybody's been watching you, except for Siri and Alexa, but that's kind of a joke, right? There's no one watching you unless you've been on FaceTime or the phone. And even those little things count. And they count very much because either that day is going to be a step back. If you manage to hold it in neutral, you did pretty good. But you really want that to be a step forward. And learning to see the progress in the mundane and repetitive steps is really, really tough. A lot of folks don't get that. They're looking for the, the big home runs. They're, they're looking for the touchdowns. They're looking for those big moments that everybody jumps up and cheers. And if you get one or two or three of those in your life, go for it. Enjoy it while it happens. But I want you just to pause in your mind for a moment and count those extremely momentous days where they were really felt like a leap and a major change in your life. How many can you come up with? And all of a sudden you're going, well, I don't know. Now there have been some, but, but now here's a little bit of the trick though, is even those days are somewhat repetitive throughout humanity. So I would definitely say the day you got married was an awesome day. I would say it was a life-changing day, hopefully for better and not worse, but it, it changed the trajectory of your life, right? Okay, so there's one. But then again, most everybody gets married, so you might not have thought of that one. And then you had kids. Wow, wasn't that great? <laughs> and then you had grandkids. I mean, so you, you look at them, you start counting some up and go, okay, there were a few of them. But you get 365 days a year. And most of us in this auditorium have had 50 plus of those years. Now, some people haven't got up to about three of those right now, which is okay. But, you know, you, you start looking at the momentous, those monumental days, not that many. They're there, but they're not that many. So we consistently focus on the little, mundane, repetitive things, and we try to do all of those, as Christ would say, faithful in something that's very little because that's laying the foundation for our further progress as we move forward. Now, I know there's a saying that says luck favors the prepared. What I'm going to tell you, and if I remember, I'll repeat that again, but what I'm going to tell you is being faithful in the little things where nobody's watching is your preparation for that day when you have the big opportunity. We'll have an example of that in just a minute. So, Faithfulness, it's just your basic principle, and it makes the difference between heaven or hell. 
Because even though you may never have committed one of the, I know we say a sin's a sin, and people don't like when you do this, but there are the seven things the Lord hates there in Proverbs 6, so maybe we can argue that a little bit. So you never murdered anybody. Okay, that's great. I'm glad you didn't. You never robbed a bank. Okay, I'm glad you didn't do that either. You haven't been selling drugs to third graders down at the elementary school. I'm really glad you hadn't done that either. But you know, you don't have to do some of those really repulsive, repugnant, ugly sins to end up in hell. All you got to do is be unfaithful in the little stuff and be lukewarm. And you'll be there just as much as the guy who's a serial killer. It's the way it works. Lukewarm, he spews out of his mouth. So, the little things, they train us, they test us, and they, they reveal so much about us. And learning to read that part of it is tough. Now, let me a little caution here. I am not asking you to learn to read somebody else in your family or your social group about how they handle little things. I know we're aware of that. We're not, I don't ask you to be naive, but the one you can change is you. And the one you need to learn to read is you and your attitude in the little things when Satan will whisper, ah, just a little thing, don't, don't worry about that one, it'll be all right. That's the place you need to catch you in the mirror and go, well, well, wait a minute, we don't want to go that direction. So take David, for example. He trained as a simple shepherd boy. In fact, when they came to anoint the new king of Israel because King Saul had gotten so rotten, David wasn't even significant enough to bring him to the lineup. And Samuel had to go through all the sons and go, look, <laughs> the king's not here. You got another son. And, the, and they said, yeah, we got little David out there. He's tending the sheep. Why would you want to look at him? But David was the one anointed, right? And so he was anointed the next king of Israel. And right after they anointed him, they put him in a chariot and they drove him right up to Jerusalem. And they put him on King Saul's throne, right? Not the way it worked. They anointed him. I don't know this for a fact, but given the way family dynamics work, I have a pretty good idea this is true. They looked at David with the oil dripping off his hair as he was running back to go watch the sheep, which was his job, thinking, that prophet is off his rocker. He has made a mistake. He's been into too much holy wine or something because there ain't no way that little kid is going to be the king of Israel. You know how it works. You know how people think. Uh, and so he goes back to shepherding. Nobody's watching. And he's training. Day in and day out. Day after day after day. Now exactly how long you get in this span until Goliath comes along, we don't know exactly. But we do know he's in training. And then when Goliath does come and present a threat, David can say to King Saul, I watched my father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came in and took one, and this is kind of neat, he didn't say, I ran it off before it got one. He said, it came in and took one of the sheep. I went and got it back. And that Philistine would be just like one of those animals. I'll take care of this. You see the slow training process? Luck favors the prepared. David was prepared. He stepped in and all of a sudden he becomes a national hero, right? So he was faithful. And all those little bitty things that led up to that opportunity. What if he'd been lazy and irresponsible and negligent? He wouldn't have been ready to handle it, would he? In fact, he would have probably been trembling and shaking with the rest of them, scared to death of Goliath, instead of prepared and ready. So it's not the magnitude of the action we're talking about. This is where we get mixed up, because we're thinking like men think. We need to learn to think like God thinks. It's not how big the thing is. It's your heart in the thing. Do you do it with faithfulness? Remember he said, who's faithful in a little thing? will also be faithful in much. So what we're looking for is not this big, wow, look, we got to call the local newspaper. We've got to get you on social media. we got to tell everybody what you just did because this is the most awesome thing that's ever happened in Pine Bluff. No. It's a little bitty thing. 
and doing those little things with love, devotion, and faithfulness. Those regular, repetitive, cutting the grass. Mundane tasks, right? Those regular, somebody's got to have their name on the meal list because they didn't get coordinated and somebody's not the coordinator. How many times a year does that happen? It's a repetitive task. Filling the, the Lord's Supper baskets, repetitive, mundane. We're not doing a, a video shoot of you, you know. Oh, here's Megan back here filling the Lord's truck. Like oh, we'd use a phone, wouldn't we? There's like old camera there. So, you know, and we're going to put this on YouTube, and we're going to get 10 million views because nobody's ever filled the Lord's Supper baskets before, right? Repetitive, mundane, just the same old, same old. But when God looks at us, do it with love, devotion, and faithfulness to that task, God sees what he wants to see, a faithful heart. And that's what God is looking for. So he's looking at our hearts, and as, as the Old Testament verse says, it's one of the Chronicles, I forget, but it says, the eyes of the Lord search the earth to and fro, looking for a heart that's faithful to him. That's it. And where is he looking? Attitude, disposition in the way we do our normal, everyday duties. And when we do them with a sense of excellence, and everything we do, we do it as we do it unto the Lord, that's the heart he smiles on. So it's kind of neat, because you can have two people doing the exact same task. One of them going, I don't know why I'm going to do this stupid old task. Six other people do it here. I'm stuck doing it. I don't remember. God sees that heart. He says, not the one I'm looking for. And he sees somebody else doing the exact same task with love and devotion and faithfulness. He goes, ah, that's the heart I'm looking for. So we're going to be faithful in just a few things. That's kind of neat. You don't have to do a million things. So this is out of the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, 20 through 21 is what we're looking at. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted me with five talents, five talents to me. You see, I've gained five more. And his master said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful slave. Now, I highlighted this because this is the part we usually just kind of right over and don't give it much thought. He said, You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things, enter into your joy of your master. Now, Look at that again, because usually when you think, I've got one talent guy, we got the two talent guy, we got the five talent guy, and we're looking at the five talent guy, and we're going, wow, he got five whole talents. He, he must be, whoa. And we put him way up there on a pedestal. His master said, you were faithful with, what did he say? A few things. Five talents wasn't that mind-blowing of a tremendous, fantastic, let's-make-the-headlines kind of event. To his master, it was a test. I gave you a few things. You handle them right. I'm going to give you some more. That, that's it. And it does take the, the, face, the stress off if you think about it. So, so he graduated from mundane to on up the ladder, which is kind of cool, which is... I think what we're supposed to be doing. We're saying I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining day by day. Still praying as the onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Well, how are you going to do it? I know it's cliche. The journey of a thousand miles begins with what? The one, that one step. And you know what? There's a whole bunch more steps before you get to the end of that one. And every single one of those steps is important. Think about Joseph for a moment. He was just an ordinary kid. He was uh, faithful to his dad. You know, he would run errands. He would check on his brothers. Now, his brothers didn't like that because when he checked on his brothers, his brothers liked to cut corners. And when Joseph saw they were cutting corners, he went back and gave a honest report to his dad. Now, his brothers thought that was a bad report, but it was truthful. Joseph was faithful in a little thing. Now, when you're faithful in a little thing, sometimes it can catch us a flack because later on his brothers, not liking that Joseph was faithful in little things, decided they'd be better off if he was somewhere else. And so they sold him into slavery. 
And he again, as a slave, was faithful in everything that was assigned to him until Potiphar said, this guy's got something going on, put him in charge of the house. Now, unfortunately, Potiphar's wife thought he had something going on too, and he ends up in prison because he's faithful in what he does. And he lands in prison, and again, he's faithful in what he does. And, of course, what we tend to see is the end of the story, where he gets promoted to the second in Egypt, which is really cool. Now, you get one of those, take it. But my point is, until the opportunity came along, he was in training, he was in training, he was in training. Luck favors the prepared. Joseph was prepared. When the big opportunity was there, he was ready to handle it. So we do the little things we do them for God, Colossians 3, 23 and 24. <clears throat> Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Now that gets a little tough, doesn't it? So you do your job. In other passages, he'd say the same thing. If you're slave or free, when you're working for the other guy, don't even see the other guy. You're working for the Lord. In fact, he would tell servants to adorn the gospel of God by their good behavior, by their good example on the job. As Christians, we want to be people who are in the repetitive daily task of our job, doing them with such fidelity that those who are watching over us, our managers, would go, man, I wish every one of my crew was a Christian like him. He's a really good worker. That's doing Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what we're after. So our, our little things are what really reveals our faith to God. Now, the big things are important. The, the thing is, they, they just don't come along that often. They're there, but even if you could count four, five, six times a year, they come along. You have 365 days a year, if I got my number wrong. You got all those days a year, so okay, that took care of six of them. What are you doing the other 350 days? I'm just doing what I want, when I want, how I want. <laughs> ah, that's not the way it works. We're a Christian in everything we do. That's hard to keep in mind, isn't it? Because it is repetitive. It is redundant. It is the same, oh, same, oh. So that's where we let our light shine. That, that's the place. And that's the trick to mastering Christianity. So the test of being small. That's where we all start. Every oak tree began as an acorn. So I don't know about in your yard, but in my yard, over in that, that side lot that's actually a separate lot, we got an oak tree so big around that it's Jeff and I and Mark and Chris all locked hands and tried to reach around it. I'm not sure we'd get around it. It is one big oak tree. Used to be one that sat on this property right here, and it got felled over by a storm, remember? <laughs> uh, that was some work breaking that thing up, and we got it done. But whatever you're thinking of, and I'm hoping you're thinking of a really big one, it started so small you could hold it in your hand. And you look at it and go, I think the deer would like this. And the deer would eat it. That kind of thing. That's, that's what we do. We grow really slow, deliberate, premeditated, on purpose, day by day, not overnight, but a long series of really not so impressive steps. But they add up to an impressive place. And if you can see that, you just, you go, and you go, and you go. And that's how we grow. And part of the problem is, the steps are so small spiritually, you scarcely can see them one day at a time. Probably one of the best places you're going to get a glimpse of it is your daily Bible reading. But even there, it's hard to see on a daily basis, but by the time you get to the end of the year, of course, you've read the Bible through cover to cover, and there are some people in the world that think that's a pretty amazing achievement, and then some of us have been doing that Bible reading app for I've lost the number of years, 
And you can honestly say, I've read the Bible through once a year for, and you just list the number of years you've done it, and your knowledge is built up a little bit each time, and you really are a really good Bible scholar now. But when you break that down to the single day, it's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? But you know what happened, because you know where you're at. And we grow just as slowly as the oak tree grows, and that's okay, because God's not looking for overnight success. That's what men look for. That's what the flesh looks for. God's looking for that slow, consistent, I'm going to say deep roots, anchored solid that the storm can't blow. And he's just looking for one step at a time. One simple little step at a time. Now, if you can back up uh, and be aware in your mind that it's all training uh, and kind of get that perspective, you might have to meditate on some things a little bit. It, it will help you there. So that's why we're faithful in the, in the little things, in the little bitty things, because it's all part of our forward momentum. Let's use the five loaves and two fishes. This is John 6, 9, just one verse out of it. There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fishes, but what are these for so many people? And, of course, you know that story. They fed the 5,000 in that text. But nothing's impossible for God. Now, now, we have these verses. I should have put them down there. There's about three places where he says, it's a little different wording, but nothing's impossible for God. Then we have Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then we look at ourselves and we go, yeah, but you know, i got nothing. All i got, you know, I, I don't even have five barley loaves. I don't even have two fish. i got this little slice of bread and a sardine. <laughs> you know, we, we look at our stuff and, and we like to minimize what we have and, and belittle and degrade it. As, and I think, you know, this is the flesh trying to go, look, I got so little, God could never use it. I'm excused. I'll go play now. I think that's the flesh. No, you, you missed it. You have so, so little that when God uses it, He gets all the glory because it is obvious that it's Him doing it, not man. Not you by your own ability. Remember Paul? 2 Corinthians, it's chapter 12. Can't give you the exact verse. But he says his glory and his strength is in our weakness. And learn to just embrace our weakness and say, okay, here it is, God, that's all I got. I got a couple of crumbs and I got a little grease left over from one fish. That's all I got. He's a perfect. That's one. And you remember Gideon? And he had all these men lined up for war, and God said, No, you got too many. Got them down to three hundred. And God said, okay, that's small enough I can use. That, that's, that's one of the tricky things to get through our head. He delights to use our littleness. Gives him an opportunity to get the spotlight, if you would. If it's all on our greatness, who's getting the spotlight? And, you know, we are. So those great opportunities, the big ones, they don't come along very often. I want to say again, when they do, you enjoy them, but otherwise don't. Small opportunities. They're around you every day. Every day. But you've got to learn to see them. They're here today. They're here right now. They're here this afternoon. They're going to be here this evening. They're going to be here all the way up to the time you fill in your head, Mr. Bow. You learn to see them. They're everywhere. It's the size of our faithfulness that matters. So small beginnings. It all proceeds one minute at a time. That's the way life works. I want to make it to my 50th wedding anniversary and get a whole lot closer. And I think I have made it abundantly clear that I do want a really good party when that comes around. It's the cake. You know, all that icing in the cake. It's the one time you can go, I am supposed to have this, but I'm going to. And they go, it's your 50th. Go ahead. And I do want the big, I call it the big ugly plate with the 50 on it. I'm going to hang that in my office because I don't think Sharon really wants that hanging in her house. Well, she may, you know, she gets dibs on it. But, you know, if you're going to get to your 50th wedding anniversary, it takes 50 years. You can't jump ahead. You know, I, I'm sorry, I know this is not politically correct, but I know we live in this crazy, stupid society now where somebody can go identify as a cat 
and my pronoun is meow or something, and you're supposed to respect that kind of nonsense. You know, it doesn't work that way. Sorry. I want to identify as a 50th wedding anniversary celebrator, but there's only one way I can do it, and that is to put in every minute, every second, every hour, every day of those 365 days for 50 plus years. There's no other way. And most all of that, I don't mean this to sound bad, is repetitive, mundane, normal, non-headline making. It, it's just not going to happen. Now, I think I might make her headlines. Took her out to the movie the other night. We had a good time. We're getting old, though. We were in way before 10 o'clock. And I just have to look at her and snicker. Oh, you know, it's like 7 o'clock. We're getting home on a Friday night date. You know we're getting old, right? And she said, yeah, but it was a good movie. It was Twister, incidentally, if you're curious about what movie. So you, you plant your smallest seed. You take your smallest step. Don't, don't be gone. Well, this is too little. No, you take the smallest one, and you just keep moving forward. All God wants is your faith, your availability. Here I am. Send me. That, that's, that's the part he's after. And all he, if all he wants you to do is, is keep a certain street corner clean, keep it clean. Make that the cleanest street corner in the whole world. Give him your faith, your fidelity. That's it. And he'll take our little bitty stuff and he'll use it for his agenda and that's going to be to our glory. So definitely don't despise the little things. God's looking for the heart. And that's what we're going to keep bringing into it. We're going to be real careful about compromise. Let me hit this quickly and we'll start winding up. Hebrews 2, 1, for this reason we must pay closer attention to what we've heard so that we don't drift away. Drifting starts with the little things. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't even have to be totally wrong. Just, just a little step off, you know. Is it wrong for a man and a woman who work in the same office, the same factory, the same school to be friends? I'd say no. When does that friendship cross a line and become unwise? Well, it's hard to put into words, isn't it? But when it happens, everybody knows it. Well, a little harmless flirting never hurt anybody. Maybe not. How many affairs started with something little? You see what I'm saying? Uh, and so, no. Be really, really super careful about the little things. Solomon, smart as he was, his wives eventually turned his heart away from God. You can read all about that in First Kings, starting chapter 11, verse 1. Don't, don't even go. When Satan says, it's just a little thing, well, that's your excuse in your own head. This is just a little thing. That ought to be an alarm. That ought to be the, the, the it ought to just wake you up and go, whoa, wait a minute. If I'm saying it's a little thing, then Satan knows he's getting ready to get me off track. And it doesn't matter if it's just a little bitty hook he sets. When he sets it, one concession leads to another, to another, to another. So what we want is that reward of diligence. The sluggard craves and gets nothing. So the diligent is made fat. Now I know how to get a fat belly. I want to get a fat soul, if you would. So impatient people, they don't want to mess with the little things. But we're in a spiritual marathon. We're running, we're running, we're running. And we're going to run till we're 70, 80, 90 years old. I don't know. But we're going to plant seeds every one of those days. Not for today. But for tomorrow. For heaven. And that's going to be a garden that's just a bunch of little, little things. So we're going to persist. One step at a time. One kind word. That's a good thing. A listening ear. A helping hand. It's just going to be those little significant, insignificant things that keep moving us forward. And if nobody else ever looks, it don't matter. All we're doing is aiming to impress God. Can you get that in your head? If you can get that part in your head, nobody else cares. Other people think I'm wasting my time. That's all right. But as long as God says, well done, our good and faithful servant, you need to waste a thing. So we aim to impress God, not just people. Uh, that changes it 
entirely, doesn't it? So, who are you aiming to impress? Who's your audience, if I can say it that way? I want you to do all the little things you do to impress God. Now, let me try to drive that home just a second. I know I'm two minutes over, but we'll, we'll survive. We're getting ready to sing, Hark the Gentle Voice of Jesus. I don't care how you sing, but I care what heart you bring into it. Are you with me? If you sit there and sing and nobody wants to hear you, but your heart's into it, amen. You get, you get ten stars, you get two thumbs up, you get, you get God's total approval. You got ability and you sat there and you just kind of mumble on and well, I got to sing this stupid song. You see it, don't you? Right? And you missed it. Prayer time. We're going to pray right after that song. Where's your heart in that prayer? We're going to visit with one another in between classes. We ought to be visiting with one another because this is our church Family. Now, if you need to go to the restroom, I understand. I'm an old man, too. Well, there's a difference between taking care of necessity and I'm going to hide in the restroom. You get what I'm saying? And then we're going to come back and we're going to do this all over again. And what I'm asking you is, where's your heart in the process of all of this? Because that's what God's looking for. If your heart's not in the right place, you may need to respond to the public invitation. It just may be a private thing. You take care of it while together we stand and sing.